Welcome to chapter four for our astronomy class. I'm going to do a little bit of a lecture here for you, mostly looking at different things that are available to us in terms of what we see in the sky. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this before, especially in chapter one, uh, but we'll also look at a couple of pieces of history and we'll look a little bit at solar eclipses and lunar eclipses and we'll look a little bit more at those in detail in a later lecture. So don't worry if I tend to gloss over those rather quickly uh, for this time along the way. Uh, but please join me for chapter four and I will see if I can share the screen here again with you. Uh, let's see, no, it doesn't always want to work for me. Uh, let's see, let's go to share. There we go. And let's see, I want to do the slideshow. Yay, there we go. Okay, we're up and running, earth, moon, and sky. Uh, when we are looking at the sky, depending upon where we are on the planet, we see different things. We've talked about that before because some things are in the way. And when we have the advantage of the Hubble Space Telescope, like we are seeing here in the video, uh, in, in the image, uh, we can skirt around that kind of problem. The Hubble goes around the Earth 16 times a day. It goes around once every 90 or so minutes, which means if the Earth is in the way right now, just wait a few minutes because it won't be in a couple of minutes. That's both a plus and a minus because one of the things that happens then is you lose tracking on what it is you're looking at for a while. Uh, but as we have enjoyed having the Hubble Space Telescope up in space, we have also increased our ground-based capabilities, so we're almost up to the point where being on the ground is no longer an impediment and the Hubble isn't always the best option. But we do have a new space telescope under construction and it should go up in another year or two. In fact, it was supposed to go up later this year or early next year, but I'm guessing with all the stuff that's happening right now, it's going to be delayed a bit along the way. The Hubble was launched in 1990 it was supposed to last about 10 years. We are now celebrating its 30th anniversary. But we've talked about this a little bit before, longitude and latitude. How far north and south you are is latitude. How far east and west you are is longitude. How far north and south is easy to delineate because we have a north pole and a south pole. So the north pole is 90, the south pole is 90. So we go 90 back to zero. The equator is at zero then down to the South Pole, which is 90. So 90 times four, because zero to 90, to zero to 90, to zero, that's 360, that's a complete circle. There is no East or West Pole, however. So historically, it has been determined that we start from this spot here, the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. As I mentioned before in an earlier lecture, this is also the Naval Academy for the British Navy and the British Navy would send its captains all around the world, and they all knew this spot right here. This is where, where England is. This, this is where uh, the, the Naval Academy would be, right there, where, where that dot is. And that's where we have the prime meridian. It runs from the North Pole to the South Pole through that spot. If you've ever seen the Da Vinci Code, they talk about another prime meridian just off the center there, running through Paris. And that's because Paris and London were competing with each other as to who could have the beginning of time. This is where our time zones operate. Now the French sort of went all through Europe here and they had the dominant uh, uh, culture and the dominant influence in the European field. But the British sent their ships all around the world. And that was more important for East and West. The French Navy was, was significant, but it didn't have the reach that the British Navy had. It didn't have the dominance that the British Navy had. So that's why we have our prime meridian running through this line here in Greenwich in England. Now, this is operative largely because we were able to figure out that in fact our Earth is spinning. It's not the sun going around us. We are actually spinning on our axis. As we have an axis, we spin around it. We spin around the North and the South Pole. Those are the polar axes. We can actually watch 
this happen by suspending a pendulum, as Foucault's pendulum does, over a field of obstacles like this, and actually the Earth will turn, and as the Earth turns under the pendulum, the pendulum seems to swing back and forth, but it's actually the Earth turning that causes that to happen. I'm going to see if I can find a YouTube video to post up for you on Foucault's pendulum. As we go around the sun, as I've mentioned before, we are tilted. We are tilted on our axis at 23 and a half degrees. We are tilted towards Polaris. So let's say Polaris is going to be in this picture somewhere up here. Notice it's tilted there, it's tilted there, it's tilted there, it's tilted there. In fact, Polaris would be way off the screen uh, in, in terms of, of being uh, where everything is pointed to from here. But notice we're pointed always in that same direction. So that part of the time, the northern hemisphere, notice here, it's sunnier. Part of the time, it's tilted away from the sun. It's darker. This is the winter. This is the summer over here. Half of the year, it's 50-50. These are the equinoxes. Equal night. Equinox means equal night. Solstice is the longest day or the shortest day of the year. But notice what's happening here. In the north, this is the longest day, but this is the shortest day down here in Australia. This is the shortest day up here, but now it's the longest day. So this winter solstice in December is actually the summer solstice down here. This uh, summer solstice up here is actually the winter solstice down below. So remember that we have opposites south and north, winter and summer, fall and spring. They're always going to be opposite each other along the way. We have seasons because we are tilted. A planet that is not tilted, and there are some planets that are not tilted, do not have seasons. So Jupiter doesn't have a season. Mars has seasons. Venus doesn't have seasons, but Neptune has seasons. Now, as this happens, the sun is sometimes further overhead and sometimes lower. We can actually see that right now. In the summer, the sun seems way overhead, so the sunlight comes directly down towards us. Nope, oh, let's get back here. Uh, the sun comes almost, almost directly overhead. It's not directly overhead here in, in Indiana, but it's almost directly overhead. So if the sun is up here and the ground is here, the sun rays are coming almost from directly overhead. This angle here is rather sharp. This is called the angle of incidence right here. In the winter, the sun is lower in the sky. So most of the rays hitting us have a much shallower angle. That's a lower angle there. So whether or not it's hot or cold, is more dependent upon where the sun is in the sky rather than how long it's in the sky. Uh, that's an important thing to remember. So here, if we are at the equator, see if I were to draw our little stick figure here at the equator, because that's how we'd be standing, notice the zenith. The sun is directly overhead. But if I draw our little stick figure here in Indiana, Notice the sun is no longer directly overhead. It's over here, off to the side, off to the angle. That's why wherever we are in Indiana, to see the sun in the sky, we have to look towards the south. We have to look in this direction, towards the south. If we look in the northern direction, the sun is not there. The sun will never be around the North Pole for us. It'll never be near the North Pole for anyone on the planet. But if you are down here in the southern hemisphere, if we draw our little stick figure down here, you would actually have to look north to see the sun. The sun would actually never make it to the North Pole, but that's okay because from here, you can't see the North Pole anyway. The planet is in the way. Remember, the planet will sometimes be in the way as we are moving along. So here we are in June as we're standing on our horizon. It looks like it's flat because we're all out there. The sun goes around, it always rises in the east, it always sets in the west. Then when we're 
at the equinox, it's going to be notice it's further south than it is in June, in the summer. So in the summertime, it's up here. In the fall or spring, as we're going towards the fall, if it starts out in summer, we're going towards the fall, it moves here towards September. And then from here, it moves even further south to December. So the sun goes from here to here in six months. And then it goes back again in six months. So it would go back up towards the equator. That would be March. And then it would go back up to June. That would be summer again. So it traces out a path back and forth. And that's that analemma, what we would see from what we're seeing on, on the sky, we would see a sort of lopsided figure eight as it was going through. That's the analemma that we saw before. But that happens everywhere on the planet. We'll go, we're going to see a progression of the sun going higher in the sky and lower in the sky. Because as we turn around, here's June 21st, the sun is over here. The sun is, oh, stop that. The sun is over here. The sun is directly overhead the equator. It's directly overhead. And it's also directly overhead here in the tropics. This is called the Tropic of Cancer. Here's where we are in Indiana. So it's not directly overhead, but it's high. And notice up here, you get 24 hours of daylight as we're spinning around. That's the Arctic area. Notice it's 24 hours of darkness down here. That's the South Pole. That's the Antarctic. Now, Six months from now, as we're going around the planet, or around the sun, our planet is still tilted towards Polaris, but the sun is now on the other side. It's still directly overhead in the equator, and it's now directly overhead in the Tropic of Capricorn. Notice the tropics are always going to be high, but we now have 24 hours of daylight in Antarctica and 24 hours of night in the Arctic. As we go around, the sun. We go around in 365 days plus a little bit. So we go around about one degree because they're 360 degrees in a circle. So we go about one degree every single day around the sun. As we spin on our axis though, to catch up with where the sun would be, we have to actually spin just a little bit more to get back where we were. See this little red figure here, they've already drawn it for me. To get it back to where it is, is here. This is called the sidereal day or sidereal day. As we go a little bit further, so we line up with where the sun is though, it takes just a little bit longer. So this axis, the spin on our axis is actually 23 hours and 56 minutes. That's the sidereal day. It takes us four minutes longer to get back to where the sun was the day before. That's our 24 hour day. So these are two different days. Almost always, I will ask you for the solar day. I won't ask you for the sidereal day unless I'm specifically asking you what's the difference between the two. Now, as we are going around, remember we have our prime meridian over here in England. So it would be from the North Pole all the way down to the South Pole. That's not a perfectly straight line, but you get the idea. So if time zones start here, we're going to go here is an, an hour later. So let's say this is 12 noon. So this is gonna be one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, then five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 10, 11, midnight. Okay, so now it's 12 over here. Well, what about the other side of the world? This would be 11, this would be 10, this would be nine, this would be eight, this would be seven. New York is about five hours off of London. This would be six, five, four, three, two, one, and midnight again. But here's the thing, this is midnight on a different day. From this. That's why this line here is the international date line. Because here you're going forward in time, here you're going backwards in time. So when you cross this line, you're changing dates. Way back when, 
all of the ship captains here in England were learning about the prime meridian, ships would move so slowly, it never really mattered. Because by the time you got from anywhere over here to anywhere over here, it would take weeks. And you just basically ask what day it was over here and recalibrate your calendar. Now, however, we can take a jet plane from here to here in less than a day and even return. So you could actually go back and forth and have the date change twice for you. So that becomes a significant thing on our planet. We've been counting time in a lot of different ways. There are lots of different ways to tell time. Most of the time we use clocks and calendars. People have been using a lot of different things for calendars and clocks. One of the earliest ways of doing that is with a sundial. And here we have an obelisk, an Egyptian obelisk. This is actually in a different city from any in Egypt. I usually give extra credit if someone can come up with the answer, which city has the most obelisks in the world? The answer is this one, it's Rome because Roman emperors used to bring obelisks back on a regular basis when they took over Egypt. But if you position it properly, one of the things to notice is we have this shadow that's being cast. And as the sun goes across the sky, the shadow will also move across and it will tell you what time it is. So here, it's probably about 11 o'clock in the morning because the sun is over here and it's going across and it'll speed the way through. There are some downsides to using sundials, one of which is when it's cloudy, it doesn't work. Uh, another is when it's nighttime, it doesn't work. Also, you need to move your marker back and forth to make minute adjustments through the year. It doesn't work for uh, it to be stationary in most settings along the way. People didn't just use the sun to mark what time of day it was, however. This is Stonehenge, and in fact, I was just in Stonehenge two weeks ago, so I'll see if I can post up a picture of my being here. These stones are set up so that on the longest day of the year and the shortest day of the year and other days of the year, they cast no shadows, so you could actually keep track of the year. Uh, in the longest day of the year and the shortest day of the year, say here's the longest day in the summer, as the sun rises, it goes right between several of the stones. It casts no shadow. And then on, at sunset, it casts no shadow. Every other day, it's going to cast a shadow until we get to sunrise at the winter and sunset at the winter. It'll cast no shadows. Now, it also has a midpoint here where on the equinox days, it casts no shadows. So we have these set up intentionally. This isn't a mistake. These are set up intentionally so that as the sun goes up and down through the year in that analema form, when it's at its highest point, it's going to intersect with the stones here. When it's at its lowest point, it'll intersect with the stones down here and cast no shadows. Notice this is 1550 BC. That was before there was reading and writing. So they were figuring this out before they could read and write. The same is true in the Mayans, the Mayan culture. This even looks like a ruined observatory. Uh, they were very good at calculating where the sun, the moon, and the planets were along the way. And they could tell the changes of the seasons from the way that shadows would be cast. This is a unique thing in the United States. It no longer functions properly because there was an earthquake that damaged it. But on the longest day of the year, and only on the longest day of the year, the sun pokes between different rocks that cast shadows and, and has this sunlit pattern called the sun dagger. On the shortest day of the year, there's a different pattern. And on the equinox days, there's a different pattern. That's also not a mistake. Those stones were set up intentionally to make this happen. In Scotland and a few other places, we have moon circles. The moon, as it goes around us, has phases. We can chart that out every month. But sometimes the moon is higher, sometimes it's lower. We wobble a bit, as we've talked about before. And that whole wobbling, along with the monthly patterns, traces itself out once every 18.6 years in a pattern that it corresponds to these stones. Again, these are written, or these are, are 
crafted before anything was ever written down. There was no reading and writing back then, but they could tell the pattern of the sky. This is from almost 20,000 years ago. This is a cave painting in France, and these may be the phases of the moon that are depicted here on the cave. As the moon goes around us, we have our different phases. We've talked about that before. Remember, Venus also has phases because it also responds to the sun relative to us. As the moon is going around us, half the moon is always illuminated, half the moon is always dark. But from where we are on Earth, what we see changes. If we're standing over here on the dark side of our planet, we will see a full moon. So let me draw our little stick figure over here. So if we're standing over here, what we're seeing when we look up at the night sky is this. So we're going to see a full moon. If we are standing over here, and the moon is in the sky over here, we're going to see first quarter. If we're standing here, and the moon is over here, we're going to see a crescent. So as the moon moves around us, again, it depends on where we are on the planet as to what we're going to see, but we will see the waxing crescent at some point as we travel around. We travel around in 24 hours. The moon travels around in 28 days, or a little over 27 days along the way. So these phases, we have phases of the moon, our planet, notice this, if this were our planet, we would say this is a quarter Earth. If we look like this, we could say it was a crescent Earth. All bodies have phases depending on where you're looking at it. But as the moon goes around us, and I'm going to look for a YouTube video to demonstrate this as well, the moon faces us. The moon always has the same side towards us. Because as the moon is going around on its axis, it's also, oh, come back here. It's also going around at the same rate. So it sort of slowly spins as it's going around. Its spin on its axis matches the spin around the Earth. And that's why it actually always has the same side towards us. So this side of the moon over here is this side here, is this side here, and is this side here. So we never actually get to see that side of the moon ever. It never faces us. The first time we saw this was in the 1960s when we sent up probes that went to the other side of the moon and back and took pictures. Otherwise, we've never seen it. It's never faced the earth uh, in, in human history. But as the moon goes around us, it takes a little over 27 days to sort of start in one spot and go around like this. But again, to line up to where the sun is, this is 27 days, but it takes a few more days to get to where the sun is. So our phases go on 30 days. So we have two different months, the sidereal month and the synodic month. The sidereal month is just how long it takes to go around the earth. The synodic month is how long it takes to go around the earth and get back to where the sun was relative to the phases. So our phases take about 30 days. That's why we have confusion with regards to our months. Some days, or some months have 30 days, have, some have 31, some have 28, except this year it had 29. Different cultures have different months. We are pulling on the moon. That's what keeps the moon going around us. That's that gravity we talked about in chapter three. But the moon is always pulling on us as well. We share gravitational forces between the two. The Earth is pulling on it, the Moon is pulling on the Earth. But notice they're different sizes. So the pull of the Moon gives us a little bit of a differential that's here. And that can cause a lot of different issues, including the tides. And I am going to post up a video on the tides for you, because there's a really interesting place called the Bay of Fundy, and I'll show you a picture here in just a moment, where the tide rolls in and rolls out in a spectacular way. But as the Earth is being pulled by the moon, it pulls water more than it pulls the solid Earth. 
So it's pulling water more, so you get a high tide. And then the earth gets pulled, and it leaves some water behind. So you get a high tide on the opposite side, too. So we get high tides twice a day on our planet. Here's the Bay of Fundy. These are pictures, but I'll show you a video that's much more dramatic here. When the high tide is in, you can get in your ship and go out, and the high tide rolls out, and you now have low tide. Look how far away the coast is there. It's really far away. There are tidal islands around the world where when the tide comes in, the walkway across to the island or the land attachment gets flooded. And then when the tide goes out, you can walk across again. But as the moon goes around the earth, it pulls in different directions. If the moon is over here during a full moon and the sun is in the opposite side, we call that a spring tide. Doesn't matter for the season. That's not a seasonal affectation there. When the moon is perpendicular to the sun, the sun is over here and the moon is perpendicular. We call that a neap tide. So notice the tides, notice this tide is not as high as this tide here. So the tides are higher and lower in a sequence throughout the month. Uh, people who have made their living on ships or on fishing or in uh, uh, coastal towns throughout history have figured out the sequences of the tides. The tidal friction here, as we move around our axis, the water sloshes around, and that creates a little bit of friction, but we also have the moon here pulling on us, and as it pulls on us, it's actually escaping. The moon has been locked. We're slowing down. The moon has already slowed down so that it's not showing the other side to us again. Our spin is slowing down, and the moon, as in, to compensate, is actually inching further and further and further away. One of the first guys to figure this out is a guy named George Darwin. He is, of course, related to Charles Darwin. You probably recognize that name uh, from the ideas of evolution. George Darwin is best known for figuring out all of this tidal friction and tidal action that was happening there. But it is true that the moon is getting further and further away from us. It's going out by an inch or two. Now, as the moon goes around us, we get eclipses sometimes. We talked about the eclipse seasons a bit. When the moon goes behind the Earth for a full moon, it always has to be a full moon for a lunar eclipse. It will sometimes go through the shadows cast by the Earth. Notice the Earth casts two shadows, an umbra and a penumbra. Umbra means dark, penumbra means almost dark or outside of the dark. But we can sometimes go all the way through. Sometimes we just hit it partially. So we have a partial or a full lunar eclipse. When the moon is on the other side, over here, the moon's shadow is much smaller. That's why if you went to see the eclipse in 2017, you might have had to have gone somewhere other than Bloomington because it didn't hit here in Bloomington. Notice we also have a penumbra. That's where you get the partial shadow. That's where you get the partial eclipse. But the moon being smaller casts a smaller shadow. Here's another image of the geometry of it. If you're seeing a partial eclipse, you're having the moon cover only part of the sun. If you're seeing a total eclipse, it covers it totally. Sometimes we have the moon a little bit further away. Remember, it doesn't go around in a perfect circle. And that's where we get the annular eclipse. We talked about that once before. Annulus in Latin means ring. So here again, the moon's shadow hits just a very small part of the Earth. The Earth's shadow, being much larger, hits a large part of the moon almost every time. When we get lucky and we see a total eclipse, we see the corona. And unfortunately, that word now has a bad connotation. But the corona is basically a, uh, an atmosphere, an area of gas around the sun that we can only see when we blot out the sun here. It's a very hot and very vibrant thing, and it's actually quite spectacular to watch. So as the lunar eclipses and the solar eclipses happen, you can see the geometry of the movements there. We talked about this once before also. Uh, when the moon is closer to us, it is larger. We call that the perigee or supermoon. When it is further away, it's the apogee or mini moon or micro moon. I don't like micro moon. It, that sounds too tiny. 
if we have a solar eclipse when it's at apogee or the mini moon, it doesn't cover the sun completely. Remember what I said a moment ago, the moon is inching away an inch or two uh, uh, every year or two from the earth. Eventually, this is the only kind of eclipse we're going to have as the moon gets further and further away. It won't happen in your lifetime, won't happen in your kids or grandkids lifetime, but a thousand years from now, we'll just be beginning to see that this is creeping up to us. And a hundred thousand years from now, it'll be a reality. As the moon goes around the earth, it goes around at about five degrees on a wobble. So sometimes the shadows miss and sometimes they miss over here. But at least twice a year, they will line up on the nodes. I mentioned this once before in an earlier lecture too. The nodes are where the eclipses happen and you'll always have a new moon and a full moon, a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse within two weeks of each other. And I think that's all I have for that. Let me stop the sharing there. So uh, I think that's it for chapter four. If you have any questions, let me know. And I will see you again in chapter five.